Well, good afternoon. Uh, today we are here to celebrate a life and what a life it was. Um, I think uh, Dr. Sklar would be surprised to see this new building because as a student, before I was dean, I would visit him in what was termed the interim building. Uh, he had a suite of uh, offices and labs and uh, I'm looking around the room and there were a lot of people who spent a lot of time in those labs, many of them earning a doctor of medical science. Um, but we got rid of that Quonset hut. But uh, looking at the crowd in here, maybe Charles, we need a bigger auditorium. <laughs> um, <clears throat> interestingly, um, my connection with Dr. Sklar uh, dated to a year when he supported me on his pathology training grant, even though I wasn't a pathologist. Uh, I was an oral and maxillofacial surgery fellow at the time, uh, but it probably can't be a coincidence that tomorrow morning I'm leaving to go to give the UCLA commencement address, and guess who the dean is? Dr. Nohi Park, who spent some very important time with Dr. Sklar and sends his regrets that he couldn't be here. In fact, UCLA is celebrating their 50th anniversary. Uh, and UCLA, the dental school, was started by the previous bracket professor, Radar Sognus, um, <clears throat> who went out there and started a dental school. And that dental school is now 50 years old. This dental school will be 150 years old in two years. We miss Dr. Sklar. He was a force in his own quiet way. Um, never flamboyant, but always effective. A man of great honesty and integrity uh, who was um, very rigorous in reviewing papers and uh, providing direction, and I'm sure we'll hear about that today. So I'm really honored, and um, Sue, this is a unbelievable tribute to uh, Jerry, and um, I look forward to the rest of the program. Thank you for coming, and welcome. Uh, th thanks, Bruce. So <clears throat> my name is Steve Somas. Uh, I'm the Master of Ceremonies for this, and uh, in that capacity, I'll take uh, a little bit of a prerogative in providing a few uh, remarks. I first met Dr. Schlarb, uh, I think my first day of, uh, of dental school. It was one of those welcome to dentistry orientation uh, programs at Tufts. I remember he uh, talked about uh, oral cancer and the research that he was doing uh, in oral cancer. And, and very importantly to me, uh, extended uh, an, an invitation to anybody who was interested to come to his lab and, and, and get involved. And uh, I can say from experience it wasn't a, an idle invitation because two months later I was uh, in the animal house painting uh, cheek pouches of hamsters with DMBA, which I think was a prerogative of anybody who, uh, or, or a requirement of anybody who worked in, uh, in his lab uh, at the time. Um, so that was at, at, at Tufts, and it gave me really, uh, before he moved to Harvard, uh, a, a couple of years to experience um, not only uh, Dr. Sklar as a scientist, but sort of as a, uh, an individual and really understand the culture of the kinds of uh, ideas that he was able to develop. I also learned a little bit about his, his history. I, I've, I've said before that the two most important figures to come from Canada to Boston were Bobby Orr and Dr. Sklar. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and that, uh, that, that, uh, that's true. His dad was a, a dentist. Uh, he was, uh, in his uh, pre-college years, an outstanding uh, musician. He was a flautist, and uh, thanks Sue for, for providing the music which was so important uh, in his uh, life. Uh, fortunately for us, he went to dental school in McGill. Uh, and actually practiced general dentistry for a year in, uh, in Montreal. And uh, one of the seminal events in his life uh, was a, uh, a meeting that, at which Dr. Glickman uh, was uh, speaking. 
uh, and, and uh, Dr. Glickman for, uh, was a periodontist, but also had a, a very scientific mind and an interest in the relationship of the oral cavity and systemic disease. He sparked uh, Dr. Sklar's interest, and lo and behold, uh, within the year, uh, Dr. Sklar was at, at Tufts uh, learning about uh, perio, in which he ultimately became board certified in addition to uh, oral pathology, uh, and worked uh, developing uh, science. Well, sort of the rest is history. He's focused on uh, oral pathology, uh, spun off that department uh, at Tufts. We're a very met uh, metricing group, I know, and if you look at sort of his accomplishments uh, in that way, uh, you know, he had over 300 uh, publications, numerous uh, chapters, uh, books. They were, rec you know, he's recognized internationally by uh, award uh, after award. And while those things were important, the things that most resonate with me is his character. Uh, Bruce has already mentioned uh, his integrity. He was absolutely transparent. What he said was, you knew that he was going to act on. There was no, there were no nuances. He was enormously loyal. He was loyal to uh, his faculty. He was loyal to students. He could uh, never do enough to advance uh, all of our careers. And I, I venture to say that at least 50% of the people in this audience wouldn't be where they are now were it not for uh, his efforts. Uh, he was, you know, if you went into him and, and you had a, an idea and something that was totally peripheral, he would take it seriously. He would pick up the phone, and in two days, you would be sitting in the office of the world authority on whatever that topic was. And it just is um, an example of the kind of interpersonal relations and skills and trust people uh, placed in him. He was a tremendous uh, innovator. He was an innovator scientifically. Uh, in preparing for this, I was telling Paul, I went and looked at some of his uh, early publications, like in 1954. Uh, 1953, I think the first four or five publications talked about um, the relationship between oral pathology and systemic health. You know, we read about that two years ago, we think, oh, we're, you know, we've had an epiphany. The fact is, um, he was thinking and, and researching this uh, for years. Um, I think equally important is he was innovative uh, in terms of social conscience and the way he ran uh, the department. Um, he was totally uh, inclusive. He was a champion of minorities and women. Uh, Helen and I were talking before the program in terms of uh, how effortless he um, made that occur way before it was fashionable, way before it was um, PC. He was obviously uh, a brilliant guy, a Renaissance man who knew a ton about a lot of things. He had, um, despite all of this, he was one of the most humble people that I think uh, any of us has ever met. He was never self-promoting. Uh, he was always, if there was anybody that he could promote or push ahead, it was always the student or the, the faculty member or a, or a colleague, but never, uh, never himself. And then finally had a great sense of, great sense of humor. Um, you know, if you, if you think of him, he always had that sort of asymmetrical smile <laughs> and, and his laugh. You remember his uh, his laugh, and he, he, was, uh, he was just uh, an all-around wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, man, teacher, mentor. Um, he meant a tremendous amount to me, and I'm, I'm sure to uh, all of you, and having you all up here today is, as Bruce mentioned, a, a wonderful uh, tribute. So thank you very much. Um, with that, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce his uh, oldest son. He had uh, two sons, David and Michael, and a daughter, Ruthie, correct? And um, David is a, a, an attending physician uh, at uh, Cooper University uh, Hospital, and I'm going to ask uh, him to say a few words for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Sonis. It was beautiful. Um, I'm not sure that anyone is ever ready to, uh, to talk about uh, their father uh, and, uh, in the past, uh, but he more than anyone would, would want me to be here to celebrate him, um, not, to, uh, not to bewail our loss of him. So John, John Stewart did a, 
a riff about a year ago that suddenly struck me as extremely funny um, and a very good starting place to discuss Dr. Schlar as my father. Um, John Stewart uh, came on and said, you notice how everybody's kid is special today. My kids are special. So you go to school, everybody's kid is special. John Stewart's my age, by the way. When I was growing up, no one was special. <laughs> you are not special. <laughs> you, meaning me, are really not special. Jerry made us as children feel special. He always let us know that we were special. This is in the 50s and early 60s when no one was special. Um, and I think that was most important. I think his students would agree as well. And from what I've already heard, he made them feel special as well. He never stopped being encouraging for anything, it seemed, that I, that I tried. Uh, even in times when we didn't get along, and there was certainly as long stretch as there is with all sons and fathers, a source of pain, I think, to him and to me that uh, we really didn't get along. Um, even in those years, he never stopped encouraging, whether it was school, college, where he predicted, uh, against everyone else's uh, sense, how well I would do, um, even as a physician. Uh, I'm not sure that I ever came to truly appreciate him until I became a father myself, as is, I think, the case for many people. Um, what I think of now and even then, I remember most is the sweetness. The humor and his brilliance people have already talked about. What I remember most of all was the sweetness as a father. Again, at a time when fathers were not supposed to be sweet or gentle, uh, he was both. Uh, I think whatever success I've had as a father uh, is completely, uh, completely from him and learned from him um, and from that gentleness. The other thing, of course, I remember, and this was as I was becoming a father, uh, was his bravery. Um, and it was an incident that totally changed the way I thought of him and the, way, uh, and the way we viewed each other, I viewed him afterwards, which is, he mentioned just before my oldest son, Aaron, was about to be born, he said, you know, one of the things that you, meaning me, would not have to worry about are childhood diseases. He said, you know, you were the first, uh, you were the first year of the Salk vaccine. Um, you won't have to worry about mumps, measles, any of these things. And he said, you know, I remember when you were, I would be about three or four, um, with, uh, with a cough, and I remember s staying up all night with uh, a humidifier going, and I remember the humidifier, it was this enormous <laughs> green porcelain, porcelain thing. Um, he said, I stayed up all night um, waiting to know if I was gonna give you an emergency trach or not. And my jaw dropped, and I thought about it. For my first reaction to it was, you were going to jab a ballpoint pen into my three-year-old throat? <laughs> and he said, well, no, actually it was a drinking straw. <laughs> I thought about it afterwards, though. At that time, my father was probably about half the age that, uh, that I was when I had my first child, um, and not nearly as well trained as, as I am and was to do, to do something like that. He stayed up the entire night waiting, waiting for bronchiolitis. It didn't happen. Uh, thank God for both of us. <laughs> But I thought about it afterwards, oh my goodness, as a young man, even as a clinician, having to stand there waiting on your own child to know if you're suddenly going to jam a ballpoint pen or a drinking straw into their throat um, and being confident that he could do it. From then on, I just have to say, I thought of him completely differently and, and honestly with, with awe for all that he did as a father. My, um, my last memory of him, um, substantive memory and the one I still Hold is really only a few months before he, he died, uh, really in the throes of advanced dementia. Um, and uh, we were sitting together in, in a room with this, and he was in this sort of apathetic sort of state uh, that he'd kind of drifted into. Out of curiosity, I started to tell him about an unusual cl clinical case. Um, as most of you know, and even Dr. Sonis had made allusions to it, and Dr. Donoff, um, he had a lifelong interest in autoimmune diseases and the relationship of, of oral pathology to, uh, to systemic autoimmune disease. I started to tell him about an unusual presentation. It was unilateral hearing loss uh, in a woman uh, and how he'd worked through all of the usual predictable things, Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, all of that. Uh, and, so, and it turned out to be scleroderma. For an instant, the healer came alive 
His eyes lit up. He was a different man. He was the old Dr. Sklar. So I said, scleroderma, huh? You know, there weren't that many cases at the Brigham of true scleroderma. <laughs> and then suddenly, just as quickly, he kind of drifted back into, into this mode. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, David. Uh, it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Levy, a colleague of uh, Dr. Schklar's and a student of, of Dr. Schklar's to say a few words. I've stood here before many times with the slides and all that. No slides today, at least for me. And thank you very much, Dr. Sonis, and thank you everybody for inviting me to speak. I've entitled my 10-minute talk, The Immortal Gerald Sklar. Let's flash back about 52 years at Tufts University School of Dental Medicine on Harrison Avenue. When I was in my second year of the pre-doctoral curriculum, in dental school. I had successfully passed anatomy, biochemistry, histology, physiology, and now I was desperately trying to pass general pathology with H. Spencer Glidden. Enter Gerald Sklar for oral pathology and Dr. Irving Glickman for periodontology. Both doctors presented their materially to material totally differently. Dr. Glickman came in the classroom. He'd look around. He'd say, hmm, I fear some of our aircraft are missing. He would then proceed to take attendance, and God forbid, you were missing. <laughs> On the other hand, Dr. Sklar would come in. He'd look around with his characteristic wry smile, and straight away begin to lecture on the day's topic. One day, he came in with that classic smile and began our cl class by stating, Will Durant once said, education is a progressive discovery of our own ignorance. <laughs> I've never forgotten that statement. Even now, after I've been teaching for 40 years, I truly understand what Will Durant said. Dr. Sklar was a true mentor and educator. Both Dr. Glickman and Dr. Sklar were artful presenters. Dr. Glickman was a bit more straightforward and down to business in his presentation than Dr. Sklar who was witty, thorough, and outstandingly inspiring. Dr. Sklar had a fantastic ability to make those pink and blue histological slides come to life with true meaning. Both of the professors loved their subject and spoke with intensity that was so palpable. But why not? They both came from similar backgrounds. I was blown away by both of these doctors and totally enthralled with both oral pathology and periodontology. Dr. Sklar presented his lectures with such passion and understanding that the students in our class knew him as Jerry Sklar Sklar. So why? Why did he acquire that name? Because in order to emphasize a point, or a phrase, or a word, he would repeat it. He would repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> Although I was hardly a top student in our class, I aced oral pathology. I was captivated by Dr. Sklar. So why was I so lucky to have Dr. Sklar as a teacher? Let's go back in history. We've had a little of that already. We're going to talk a little bit more. 
In the late 1930s and early 40s, when periodontology and oral pathology were a discipline together in the Department of General Dentistry at Tufts, there was a bright young doctor, Irving Glickman, who studied general pathology at Tufts Medical School under such immortals as H. Edward McMahon, H. Spencer Glidden, and Mary G. Mueller. In 1942, the dean of Tufts, Basil Bibby, named Dr. Glickman associate professor in pathology. And in 1948, he became chairman of the Department of Periodontology as well as professor of oral pathology. Now moving ahead three years to 1951, another incredibly bright doctor, Gerald Sklar, moved from Montreal, Canada to Boston after graduating from McGill University and he entered his master's program in oral pathology with Dr. Glickman as his mentor. He received his master's degree in 1952 and then shortly began instructing with Ir Irving Glickman in oral pathology and periodontology until 1961, when periodontology became a separate department from oral pathology, and Dr. Sklar took the chairmanship of the Department of Oral Pathology, and Dr. Glickman became the head of the Department of Periodontology and Research. These two giants, for a total of nearly 20 years, shaped the history of Tufts, Tufts Dental College, soon to be known as Tufts University School of Dental Medicine. In 1954, Irving Glickman published the first edition of Clinical Periodontology, to which Dr. Sklar contributed greatly. With Dr. Glickman and Dr. Sklar's background, the aim of that book was to help train students to th thoroughly in oral pathology in order that they would become better diagnosticians by visualizing the underlying histopathology. Inspired by his desire to expand teaching, Dr. Sklar teamed up with two trained, Tufts trained physicians, Drs. Francis and Philip McCarthy. They were father and son. And he wrote two textbooks, Oral Manifestation of Systemic Diseases and Disease of, of the Oral Mucosa which were used extensively. And in 1969 to 1971, when I was in my postdoctoral years at Tufts in periodontology, we used those, uh, those textbooks along with Irving Glickman's textbooks as the Bible. I was really fortunate to have Dr. Sklar as my oral pathology teacher. That was the second time for me because the first time was when I was in my predoctoral years. In 1971, Dr. Sklar transferred to teach oral pathology here at Harvard, and I transferred to Burlington, Vermont to practice periodontology. So why am I here today? Why am I asked to, to speak with these honored people to you? I think I can explain. When Dr. Sklar left Tufts in 1971 to assume the Charles A. Brackett Professorship of Oral Pathology at Harvard, he joined what was presently called, which is presently now called, the Department of Oral Medicine, Infection, and Immunity. Although Dr. Sklar's leaving Tufts was a great loss, he had trained some excellent people to take his place. Dr. Edward Cataldo and Johnny Junta, John was my classmate, and Ed taught me, taught me when I was in my postdoctoral years. So let's fast forward now 23 years when I began teaching here at Harvard in 1994, and I connected, reconnected with my oral pathology mentor, Dr. Sklar. I was encouraged to teach here by Ray Williams, who was chairman of the department and also a co-trustee of mine in the American Academy of Periodontology and another close friend, Dr. Mark Nevins, who was a periodontal resident here in those days. In those days, we were, as Dr. Donoff said, we were in the interim building. You know, the interim building where you're sitting right now, um, 
was where Jerry was and where I was and all the people. And, and then we had to leave because they tore this building down and they made offices for us in the main building downstairs. And I was fortunate enough to share an office with Dr. Sklar. So Monday and Tuesdays, I would be here at Tufts teaching, but I'd be upstairs in the clinic, either the postdoctoral clinic or the pre-doctoral clinic, and Jerry would have free reign of our, of our office space. What happened was that every noon, we would have lunch together. So when we had lunch, we would have an opportunity to talk. So that helps answer the question of why I'm speaking to you today. It's proximity. I was then and still do practice in Burlington, Vermont. That's not proximity. But our, our work our, together here at Harvard was. And Jerry provided me with an entire remedial course in oral pathology. We became very close friends, and I would take specimens from my office if I had uh, a concern about neuropathological thing, bring them down, Jerry and I would discuss it, and he would help me make, or he would make for me, a significant diagnosis. But I want you to know that this remedial course that I was having with Jerry was not a one-way street. It was not just for my benefit. I actually paid Jerry very handsomely. <laughs> my payment was cleaning his teeth. <laughs> Frequently. <laughs> <laughs> this, of course, would help him keep his gums healthy and his breath sweet. I hope he did so. I don't know why that was successful. <laughs> But the ministrations that I gave to him uh, were helpful. And without, without violating HIPAA, I will tell you that he really was an excellent patient. He put up with my lectures on plaque control. <laughs> and he gave absolutely no indication that he was paying no attention whatsoever. Those of you who know me well, I really expect a good 95% plaque-free score from all of my patients. I should have done as well in my own examinations. Anyway, I've rambled along enough, and I want to summarize this talk by simply saying that of the two people that influenced me the greatest were Gerald Sklar and Irving Glickman. I, as so many other of you here, and of my colleagues were totally influenced and, and helped by them. Today, the specialties of oral pathology and periodontology show their influence still. My interest in research, my thirst for knowledge, my desire for teaching was initiated by these two giants, and I am incredibly appreciative. Ongoing, Jerry has willed all of his slide collection and lectures to Harvard, Tufts, and Dr. George Gallagher at Boston University. Sue Sklar has provided those slides to us, and all of this material will be sorted and digitalized and provided to the students at Harvard, Tufts, Boston University, throughout this country, and very frankly, throughout the world so everybody will still be benefiting. Nearly 60 years as an oral pathologist and a teacher, Jerry still lives. Although Jerry is not here today in person, his work is, and clear dedication to teaching is. And in reality, he is very much here. The world will, is, and will continue to be a much better place because of Jerry Sklar. Jerry is truly immortal. Thank you.
Thank, uh, thanks, Paul. So I, I had mentioned that uh, Dr. Sklar was really a, a Renaissance man. He, I mean, aside from being a scientist, uh, a musician, a clinician, he also had a, a great interest in uh, history and did substantive work uh, in history with uh, a colleague, David Chernin, who uh, is our next uh, speaker. Uh, good afternoon. I am honored to be here. And I want to thank you, Sue, for inviting me to share my memories of Dr. Sklar. The insights and remembrances of Jerry we have just heard confirms to me that Jerry was Jerry was Jerry. There appears to be a universal recognition that Dr. Jerry Sklar was a man of integrity and intellect. He had that important quality of being able to take the personal bias out of the equation in his scientific, professional, and interpersonal interactions. His interest in his students and their development did not end on graduation day. They were his adopted children, and as such, were treated like family. For me to be associated with Jerry was an honor, a privilege, and a valuable education. The first time I arrived at Tufts as a student in 1976, Jerry had already left to Harvard but he ensured that his first oral pathology department was on the capable eyes and hands of his protégés, Drs. Cataldo, Dr. Santos, and Dr. Junta. The OP department at Tufts was well run, welcoming, and engaging, just as Jerry intended it to be. I joined the staff at Harvard in endodontics as a clinical instructor in 1983, but it was not until the early 90s that we, Jerry and I, officially met. I first introduced myself to Dr. Sklar at the recommendation of Dick Wolf, the Garland librarian over at the Boston Medical, American, uh, Medical Library. At the time, I was working on the translation of an early 17th century French dental text, and Dick thought it would be advantageous to have Dr. Sklar review some of the passages. In the following weeks, I dropped in through the outer office for a chat into the back room, and I still remember some of our early conversations. Upon discovering that we had a Canadian heritage, we discussed a quick list of other Canadian immigrants here in Boston, and also exchanged the name of Delhi locations to visit. <laughs> Slim pickings here in Boston, but a large selection in Montreal. I also remember com commenting on Jerry's extensive collection, and you may remember it, that the volume of black three bind black binders that, that rang his whole office, tens, twenties, thirties. And I asked him, what's the story behind these binders? He explained that they contained his collection of primary document sources that he'd been collecting his professional life. Additionally, he was fortunate to have students from a variety of countries and he enlisted their help to translate numerous dental texts that had never been translated into English. This conversation provided the germ of the idea to work together on producing our book, the source book of dental medicine back in 2002. At the time, we did not wish to produce yet another text on the history of dentistry but rather utilize the original text to advance the basic understanding of scientific, medical, and surgical influences on dental knowledge throughout the cultural history of each of the ages we looked at. Sounds daunting? It was. Working closely with Jerry, I was able to experience and witness firsthand his intellectual, organizational, and critical thinking skills. Eight years and thousands of editing pages brought Jerry's wish, dream, and concept to reality. In our early conversations, we also shared views on our chosen clinical subspecialties. Jerry impressed me with his solid foundation on periodontal therapy. He stated with his, imp I call it impish grin, smile, 
He said, to be a good periodontist, you must first own sharp instruments. <laughs> While he did not maintain a private practice, Dr. Sklar had not only the knowledge and understanding of diseases of the periodontium, but I wager that he had the surgical skill set as an accomplished dental surgeon. Indeed, he was an accomplished musician who played the flute and enjoyed his harpsichord. Music was one of the shared interests that attracted him to Yusu, who was also a skilled musician. I remember clearly that Sunday afternoon in 96 at Jerry's townhouse in Cambridge. We were working on uh, chapter five, six, of many chapters. He mentioned he was seeing someone. He happily volunteered that, that they had known each other for many years and that they served on the cancer board together. I asked him anything more about her. He said, she's intelligent, warm, energetic, and we play good music together. <laughs> Fast forward to 97, I happily attended Jerry and Sue's moving wedding ceremony. It was shortly after the wedding that Jerry and I made a diversion to our attention to Eustatius' work on the little treases of the teeth, a classic, and both Jerry and I, if he was here, would agree that it is a gem of our collaboration. Uh, it was a labor of love for two years, uh, but Jerry approached this project after the wedding with enthusiasm and concentration. I comment that his marriage seemed good to you. He replied, we make good music together. <laughs> At the start of this century, Jerry and I were developing ambitious projects. One was a center for the study of the cultural heritage of dentistry, and I'll not dwell into that right now. Yes, and another dental history textbook, but this time to vet the reliability and validity of the past texts. While we were able to initiate the development stage, Jerry's health began to deteriorate. My 25-year relationship with Dr. Sklar evolved from colleagues to collaborators to friends. It is this last relationship that ultimately means the most to me. Jerry was the poster child for a top-shelf gentleman. He was able to gently ease into a less active state which I'm sure was possible because of the care and devotion of his wife, Sue. My wife, Maggie, and I witnessed her sustained love and attention to Jerry every time the four of us were together. Jerry did have an addiction. Chocolate. <laughs> Always an assortment with an easy reach on his table with his newspapers. Once I said to him jokingly, but you're a dentist. And he replied, but it's good chocolate. <laughs> Our last dinner with Jerry and Sue was a pleasant surprise. Mag and I were away at the time of Jerry's 90th birthday dinner. Upon returning, rather than have Sue make one of her delicious feasts that goes on and on and on, we arranged to take, bring takeout Chinese food, which we knew Jerry enjoyed. He liked crab rangoon almost as much as Montreal Deli. I do not have an explanation for the events of that evening. For over a year, Jerry had been mostly quiet, as been alluded to when we were together. This evening, he was happy to discuss all kinds of things for hours. He, he wouldn't stop talking. It was a gift to hear his voice and experience his, his wit again. When I lamented to him, that there had not been a recent good dental history book, Jerry gave one of a last glimpse of his dry wit, saying, you can always write a good book if you have a number of good books to copy. <laughs> As we said goodnight, Jerry proudly declared with a big smile to Maggie, I'm 90. Maggie replied, I know you are. It's quite an accomplishment. He, f he paused just for a moment looked at her and said with confidence, I'll think I'll make it to 100. <laughs> I, for one, wish Jerry was correct about that one. For those of, of us who were touched by the intellect, humor, mentoring, care, and love of Dr. Jerry Sklar, I am grateful for the 90 years he has given us. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. 
Well, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Sue Schlar, uh, Jerry's wife, uh, to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Donoff and Wanda, for providing us to hold this memorial service for my late husband, Jerry Schlar. Thank you, Dr. Sonis, for streamlining everybody's talk. Um, and thank you for other speakers and musicians who participated for this service. I'm immensely grateful. Uh, please take a copy of a DVD that's been made in 2006 that tells you everything about his career and his personal life as well. There's over 100 copies, particularly his students should appreciate what he had to say. As you know, the playing Mozart's quartet is to commemorate Jerry's flute playing all through his life. In fact, when he was coming over to Harvard from Tufts Steno School, the late dean, Dr. Goldie Haber, offered him to take a day off and practice dentistry in order to make up the salary difference between the two institutions. <laughs> So he took a day off and played hockey. <laughs> Not to practice dentistry, but practice flute. <laughs> in his early years in Montreal, Canada, he played the music with the late Dr. David Hubel of this medical school. And as you know, he won the Nobel Prize in medicine. In later years at Harvard, he played with our mutual friend and colleague from BU, Dr. Arnold Reif, who discovered thigh one antigen, which is the hallmark of T cells of the immune system. For those who study immunology should know what T cells are. This is so amazing thing about Jerry. Even if he led a highly productive life in research, teaching, and raising three children, he managed to take time off to enjoy himself and maintain his cool manner in all his dealings with anybody, including the house cleaner. From his gentle manner, I learned to appreciate the true meaning of gentlemanship. I've known Jerry for the past 40 years, first as a colleague in cancer research and friend, and later as my husband. Our common interest in music and cancer research brought us together. In spite of our advanced ages, we decided to marry just so we can share whatever is left in our lives together. So we traveled to Athens, Greece to receive his honorary doctorate degree from this school and as a dental historian, he likes the idea of getting this degree from the University of Athens because this school is the Plato and Aristotle's academy. So it means a lot to him. And then we traveled to Korea and lectured there together. He lectured in English simultaneously translating, and all the students stood up and gave standing ovation. And also the, the dental scholars were very happy to have Jerry there because they knew Jerry was one of the most celebrated oral pathologists around the world at the time. We went to several scientific meetings together, including the lecture trip to UCLA to see some of his students there. And at home, we wrote several articles and a book together, and while playing music whenever we had a chance to play. So we did many things together. He said, this is the best part of my life. Now I don't have to worry about my children, my students, or even the patient. Interestingly enough, my best contribution to medical science was also made within the first two years of our marriage. So as late as it was, our marriage was good for both of us. However, this good time did not last very long. 
From 2003 on, he encountered series of medical problems. After three major surgeries and several episodes of congestive heart failure and several other diseases, he could not play the flute music anymore by 2010. By the summer of 2013, his health deteriorated so bad that his doctor warned me that Jerry might, sleep, uh, might die in his sleep. So I brought him home and told him that you have to live as long as you can because I wouldn't have anybody else if you go. So he lived another year and a half, just long enough to celebrate his 90th birthday in December and have a chance to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American College of Dentists in January of this year. In spite of his poor health, he never lost the ability to give most wonderful gentle smile whenever he saw something good and kept his sound mind until the very end of his life. The last cantata you will hear is the piece I was playing on the piano. And he came over and we tried to play the Beethoven sonata for forehand just three <laughs> weeks before he died. Now that he's gone with a streak of tears in his eyes, I know I will miss him and mourn for the loss of him for the rest of my life. However, I also know that it was a great privilege and honor to have known him and shared the part of my life with him with immense affection and respect for each other. So it's fitting that we celebrate his brilliant life as a role model teacher and mentor to many of his students and faculty members and loving father to three of his children and colleague and dear friend of mine for nearly 40 years. He would be very happy to see us celebrate his life and pay tribute to him today if he were here. Thank you.